Hello, everybody. It is Friday. You have to love Friday. I feel like it's been a really long week. Um, we have been very, very busy at Find My Past, and so we are looking forward to the weekend for sure this week. Um, but we have a lot to talk about before we get to our weekend. So welcome to uh, Fridays, um, Fridays with Find My Past, Find My Past from Home. We're super excited to have you all with us as usual. My name is Jen Baldwin. I am the Research Specialist and North American Content Manager for Find My Past. Joining me in the comments today is lovely Ellie. Everybody say hello to Ellie. Uh, it has been a great week at Find My Past. We're really hopeful that you guys have had a good week as well. Um, let's see, we've got people chiming in. Thank you very much. If you are new to Find My Past From Home, we encourage you to tell us who you are, what you're up to, where you're at, what's going on in your world in terms of research, what are you working on in your family history, what stories have you uncovered? There's so much to talk about. This community is fabulous. For those who have been with us over and over and over again, we appreciate you so much uh, and just uh, absolutely delighted to be with you every week. So thank you for being back with us and, and taking some time out for Find My Past this week. We appreciate you. Um, so let's see. Karen is with us. Hazel's over on the YouTube side. Sue is with us on Facebook, a cool Guildford in Surrey. Um, let's see. Uh, Robin's in Toronto, mild but cloudy. Same here, actually, in Colorado. Robin, it's um, it's a little overcast today. Our snow is melting, which is kind of nice. Um, and quite warm this week. It's been um, It's been a nice change, actually, in the middle of winter. Uh, William's with us, of course. Thank you, William. Andrea is here. Linda's in Northern Ireland. Karen's with us. All these lovely, familiar faces. Oh, Karen joined one of our roadshow talks yesterday. Um, I was, uh, I had the pleasure of presenting to, um, uh, the West, sorry, West London Family History Society. I know that's not the official title, but um, that's what I have stuck in my head. Uh, and they were a fantastic group. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, really good times. They started the conversation by talking about books. And I was like, these are my people. Like, I love this. Uh, and I wrote down a bunch of things I need to read. Um, Yes, London Middlesex Family History Society. That's the official name. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and thank you both um, for joining us for the talk. That's great. Um, let's see. Georgia's with us. Um, she's in Essex. Andrew. Oh, Andrew says that Facebook seems to have deleted several comments um, from the forum post on 2nd of February last week, talking about Amelia Hollingsworth. And, and we don't know why, Andrew. Uh, Ellie is telling me that we're a little bit stumped on that, um, but we are going to talk about Amelia today, as promised. Uh, so I've been absolutely devoted to this project. Um, I was up really late last night working on Amelia, uh, later than I really needed to be, <laughs> I'll admit. Totally went down the rabbit hole, um, but it's been fun. It's been really good times. Okay, so Jillian's here with, from Winnipeg. It's always great to see um, my friends in Canada, Anya's with us, Sally's here. Gosh, just everybody. So good. Okay. Bev is with us. I could just read names all day long. It's just so fun to see the same people over and over again. Like it, I just, I really like these. Okay. Um, right. So lots of people chiming in. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely for joining us. All right. So as per usual on Fridays, we're going to talk about our um our new records that we've released but we are also going to talk about the question of the week ellie do we have a question of the week banner she's going to do that for us thank you ellie um so the question of the week is all about the rabbit hole uh it is a delightful question because we all get stuck down that rabbit hole. Um, so the question of the week, and please try to respond in the chat with the answer or QOTW. Thank you, Ellie, very much. What was the last genealogy discovery that sent you down a research rabbit hole? For me, absolutely has been the 1921 census. I have been just just stuck in that collection for weeks now. Um, and actually last night at the talk, they asked me if I'm, if I'm getting tired of it yet. I'm like, absolutely not. Every day is a new discovery. And it's I, Ellie and I have actually been 
um, sharing discoveries back and forth all week. And like, if you research this, then I'll I'll reach other, research that one. Like, we just can't get enough. Um, it's so fun. Um, so that's your question of the week. Please do respond in the chat, and we'll get to those um, in just a few minutes. But oh. Janine is with us from Denver. Thank you, Janine. I love when other people near me chime in. Flo's in Oregon. Katie's in Hampton, Virginia. Um, I don't know that I've seen Hampton, Virginia on one of these sessions before, so welcome. It's great. All right, let's talk about this week's records. Um, uh, what are the records this week? Right, I don't have a banner for that either. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna find stuff. You guys, I'm on top of it today. I promise, I really, really am. Um, okay, this week we released a whole bunch of content from Norfolk. Did I do that right, Ellie? She was coaching me right before we started on how to pronounce this location. Um, I know I'm not saying it right, that's okay. New baptisms, new bands and marriages, <laughs> new burials, uh, all fabulous updates to the collection on Find My Past. So let's um, get into some of those details. Uh, the marriages include archdeacon's transcripts and workhouse baptisms spanning from 1600 to 1812. Uh, so a couple of centuries worth of material there. Um, and you know, of course, those workhouse registers are always really, really fascinating. Um, sometimes, you know, definitely sad, right? You're thinking about a, a situation and a life that isn't quite really what you would hope for for your ancestor. But um, lots of workhouse registers this week. So a quarter of a million, actually, um, from the Norfolk Warhouse, Workhouse, excuse me. And that includes admission and discharge notices as well. So um, the records span across seven different workhouses and five poor law unions. Um, so that's an exciting addition. We've also got archdeacon's transcripts and then workhouse burials as well. So a lot of material to work through if you are looking for that workhouse um, content. The other part that we published this week that I'm going to start to try and make sure I highlight every time on a Friday's Live is the newspapers. Um, so we have added the, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this one for sure. Backup? Backup? I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, Times and Rosendell Advertiser from 1889. This paper specialized in um, particularly thorough reports on local events. Um, so that is really interesting, right? From our perspective as researchers, we get this really in-depth version of an article instead of these little snippets. So that's really good. I love that. We've also added the nonconformist title to the newspaper collection, and that spans from 1841 to 1880. So um, nonconformist is a good one. I definitely am going to dig into that over the weekend. Uh, I love a good nonconformist. Many of my ancestors were um, nonconformists, and that's how they ended up in in America in the first place. So that's always good. We've also added more materials to a number of collections, a number of newspapers, uh, including the Liverpool Journal of Commerce, Nottingham Evening Post, the New Milton Advertiser, the Surrey Advertiser, uh, the Daily Herald goes now up to 1960. So a lot of new, new content on newspapers. If you want the full list, I encourage you to check out the blog for the week. Uh, Bay Cup, Andrew, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we will share the link if we haven't already to this week's blog. There is a nice list, detailed list of the newspaper updates there for you. Scroll through that and see what you see that might be interesting. You know, I've really, I know I've talked about it here before, but those newspapers are really amazing. Um, and I just kind of look at the entire collection because um, geopolitical boundaries don't really work for me, right? I'm not into that. I'm not digging that at all. They, re, uh, they reported uh, material from all over the world. So it's, um, it's really, really uh, good research, right? Really good research. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm going to scroll through some of the comments um, because I want to get to the question of the week for sure. Um, let's um, let me just do this thing. Okay, question of the week. I'm going to put this back up on the screen so you guys can still continue to comment. Make sure that you're talking to each other. Uh, love that. So, um, <laughs> Beth is going to start us off because she's right. Which new discovery doesn't send us down a rabbit hole? You're right, Beth. 
totally, totally right. That is the right comment. Uh, I love that because you're right. Um, every new discovery leads to more questions, right? And that's one of the joys of family history, uh, one of the frustrations also, but one of the joys in that this hobby kind of never ends, which is delightful. Um, Karen is getting ready to go down the rabbit hole with our new records. <laughs> so that's great. Um, we hope you have a good weekend, Karen. Have fun with that. Robin's question of the week saying, I finally found my grand uncle's wife and went down the rabbit hole trying to confirm whether they had a child or not. Still not able to confirm or deny. Okay, interesting. Good. So we know what Robin will be up to this weekend because she's still in her rabbit hole. Um, that's fabulous. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> Looking at all the comments, you guys, there's so much good stuff happening around the world. And it's exciting. Okay. Oh, um, this one I don't quite understand. Some people make a discovery and then they don't stay up until the small hours of the morning. I don't get that. Is that a thing that happens? People do that? I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand that. Hmm. I don't know. Um, that's definitely a tricky one. Anya's got a good one. Let's see what Anya's up to this week. Sylvia Valentine mentioning people who had died from swallowing their false teeth. Really was my last Alice trip down the rabbit hole. So crazy how many found it. Really? From swallowing false teeth. Okay. Um, that's a blog post right there. I feel like that is a story that needs to be told. Anya, you should really email us about that. Discoveries at findmypast.com. Send us a quick email and let us know uh, if you're if you're interested in that. I think that'd be really cool. I I think I saw something about that on social media. I think I know what you're talking about, but um, I didn't read it. I'm glad you did because you you taught me something there today. All right, Ellen. Someone posted a father in England for my first widow ancestor in the U.S. Being me, I needed proof. Absolutely, we all do. I uh, spent way too much time going through a whole slew of widows born in 16th century England and found nothing. Uh, but you know what? Ellen, that's so, um, that's valuable time spent, right? That is time well spent. Uh, even though you weren't able to make the connection, you have now a pile of negative evidence and you're a lot more informed about this particular family, both in England and that original ancestor back in the U.S. Um, so, you know, pat on the back for you, Ellen. Uh, definitely be proud of that work because sometimes it is that very detailed, thorough, intense process of elimination that's required. And I know the feeling. I've done the same thing um, from my first English ancestor coming into the U.S. and in the 16th century. And I'm still looking in the London area to see if I can pinpoint the family actually in England. I know what parish she came from, but I, that's it right? It stops at the departure point, basically. Um, so Ellen, I'm with you on that. I can sympathize, but also um, also appreciate the effort there. Um, let's see, Roxanne, I'm already going down rabbit holes. Most recently, Ohio Trail Road have been the topic. It's always interesting. The Ohio migration pattern is really fascinating to me. Um, finally going a little bit of information on one of the brick walls who was a railroad engineer. Oh yeah, good. Railroad research is always interesting. I'm going to assume that's in the U.S. Um, and that's all good stuff. Uh, the railroad history in the U.S. I think is just really, really fascinating. I, I mean, I probably think it's all fascinating, right? I love history just in general. Uh, Daphne, my rabbit holes when I found out that William Gascoigne, I'm not sure, married Margaret de Percy in 1474. Now that's getting back there. Nicely done. Rabbit hole became so big I abandoned it. Yeah, got all the historical lineage. It had already been done in the history books and be honest, it got boring. Okay, yeah. You know what? Sometimes the challenge and the excitement just isn't there, right? I think I, I can kind of understand this, right? For for me, a lot of the joy that I find in this hobby is in the challenge that's put in front of me. I love it when someone says I have a brick wall because to me that doesn't exist. Uh, it's just a new opportunity to learn and discover in some new records that I've not used before. That's an opportunity, not not a wall. Um, so yeah, I kind of get this this tone that it might be a little bit boring if it's already been all done and published. Okay, Jane's question of the week. Found a name on my great, great, great grandparents' grave that I didn't know of. Okay, yeah, going to all the resources and making sure that you are examining them in full detail. A girl who died at age nine weeks doesn't seem to be related. Interesting story, Jane. That's a good one. Okay, let's see. 
Um, I'm, I'm still, oh gosh, there's so many good ones. What's this? Sean saying founding, find a soldier ancestor who fought in Italy in the 1860 and died in the American Civil War, had me researching army lists and records for years. Interesting um, to go from Italy in 1860 straight into the American Civil War, which started in 1861. So not a big gap there. That would be interesting. I wonder what side of the war he was on. Um, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um... <laughs> Let's see. Andrew found a discharge paper for someone wounded at Waterloo. Ended up researching the Peninsular War battle that was mentioned on it. He'd volunteer for the Forlorn Hope at San Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. Um, another piece of history that I don't actually know that much about. So yeah, that's a great period uh, to work in. Um, and lots of interesting military records, of course. Um, uh, military records are so good. Okay, I, there's so many of you um, tell there's <laughs> so many of you it's hard to hard to find the ones that I um, um, the ones that I haven't done yet. Okay. Oh wow, yeah, this is a good lesson. Ergo over on YouTube picked the wrong wife for Evan Evans by name of Mary Davis and spent four years on the wrong line. Been there, I'm. I'm not. I'm full of sympathy for you. I know what that feels like. Wow, um, and it is a challenge for sure. And it's not just that you have to re-research everything. It's that you kind of have to rewire your brain because you've been thinking about one family in particular in a certain way for four years, and now you have to completely shift and look at it from a different perspective. And that is difficult to do. So. Good luck to you, sir. Um, I wish you all the best in this. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a good thing that you found it, right? It's um, You definitely don't want to keep chasing the wrong line for another four years. Um, oh, this Audrey. Hello. Thank you for being with us. There's a pub for genealogists called the Rabbit Hole. Um, it's only about two feet high and it's in my living room, but still. <laughs> I would like to visit that pub. Um, is that pub open right now? Um, or are there restrictions in place? Um, <laughs> oh, Andrew, I'm having a good day. Thanks, Andrew, for acknowledging this two for two on pronunciations. Thank you so much. Um, on the spot uh, tips at pronunciation is a little tricky for me. Um, okay. I do have one of those tricky Evan situations in my tree and I started looking at it a couple years ago and then I was like, you know what? I'm not quite ready for Welsh research here. I'm going to work on the husband a bit more. It's John Lawrence in, in Birmingham instead of Sarah Evans from an adopted family somewhere in Wales. I was like, yeah, okay, too much. All right. So my question of the week, of course, stems from last week's discussion. So for those of you who are with, who were with me last Wednesday, we kind of went through this process of exploring the 1921 census as a starting point for genealogical research, right? If we, we, lo we look at the census and we get this opportunity, we get all this new information, what do we do from there? And in the midst of that discussion, right at the end, I shared the census return for a certain individual. And I'm going to put some of my slides up on the screen now so you guys can see this. So we are going to talk about Amelia's story. We started talking about Amelia last week. We posted it to the Find My Past forum. We posted it to the Find My Past page. Some of you chimed in. We appreciate that kind of crowdsource this a little bit. And Amelia has proven to be quite interesting. Um, so I promised that we would follow up. Ellie and I kind of made a deal that we would spend time on this and we would follow up on the story and let you all know what happens to Amelia. And we're ready to share, believe it or not. Okay, so here's her census return. For those of you who didn't see it last week, um, she did not obviously fill out the census the way she was supposed to. Um, we know her address and of course who she was thanks to that little snippet from the front of the census return. Um, you're looking at the novel that she wrote on the back. Let me zoom in. I do have a transcription for you, so don't even try to read this, but there is a huge amount of information on this on this page, right? So she talks about how she lost her papers at the age of 15. She entrusted the papers to the late Mrs. Forbes, um, the wife of a minister in a, a 
a Church of England parish in France. She was born in India, but doesn't know exactly where, around 1857-58. Her father was in the civil service. Her grandfather was an officer in the British Army. Both of those men died early in life. Uh, her mother's maiden name um, was offered, or her mother's full name, actually. Uh, her mom was French. She was born in Cairo. Her father's name is on the form, John Thomas Hollingsworth, fully spelled out. She's single and alone. It's quite um, a census, right? I mean, there are moments when you see things like this and you go, gosh, I'm really glad she didn't follow the instructions because she gave us so much information. So here's the full transcription. And we posted this um, uh, immediately after the session last week. Keep in mind, I found this about 15 minutes before I went live last week. And so the team kind of rushed to help and, and pull the transcription together. So when we posted this on Facebook, the first thing that needed to be done um, was, and <laughs> Sally, thank you for this. It's all coming back to me and I feel the tension rising again. Yep. <laughs> this has been my rabbit hole this week, 100%. I have not been able to let this go. So the first thing that we had to do, of course, was just finish the transcription, right? Um, so some of you from the forum and the community started chiming in on the transcription itself, right? And, and making those corrections and, and filling in those details, which was great, really, really helpful. So Kate um, gave us some um, ideas around transcription, around especially around the French part, right? The pieces that we were unsure of on that very quick transcription that we did before the session. William gave us um, some corrections on the location. So that was all really helpful. Put us in the, in the right point, right? Put, right place and time. And then we started, you guys all started digging around, right? Andrew was saying um, in the um, India Office Baptisms collection, there's a Mary Eugenia, daughter of John Thomas and Eugenia Hollingsworth. So that is um, the parents that she identified. Born 1861, father is a private gentleman, formerly head clerk collector's office. Andrew also added that John Thomas died 24th of August, 1866, age 42, also from the India office deaths collection. Um, and he kept going. Andrew was, was quite active on this search um, last week. Thank you very much, Andrew. He found a, a mention of a death of a Marie Eugenia Hollingsworth in the GRO consular death in indexes at Cairo. Um, so the theory is that mom actually took the took her daughter Amelia back to home, right? Back to Cairo after the father died in India. And I think that's correct. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty confident that's exactly what happened. Um, so then mom, Marie, ends up dying in Cairo. Uh, Karen commented that she found Thomas Hollingworth burial in Bombay, 1866, a pension, 1866, a pensions clerk. So that all is starting to line up, right? So we're, we're off to a good start already with the parents. Karen really jumped into this. Um, and and was just absolutely lovely about it, actually. So thank you, Karen, very much. And I'm sorry, your comment's getting a little cut off on my slide there. Um, so we found the burial again, right, from the Presidency of Bombay, 1709 to 1948 collection, um, born about 1824, pensioner clerk. Um, found the birth from Mary Eugenia. 20, 1861. So that co coincides with what everybody else had identified. The mother dies in Cairo. And then she went to um, the, uh, oh gosh, I don't know the full name of the organization off the top of my head, the, the uh, society that works on the British in India, um, Federation of International British and India Society, something something like that. I just call them FIBIS in my head. Not even sure if I pronounce the acronym right, but they're a great organization. If you have any British and India material, you definitely want to look at that website. Uh, and Karen did some initial searches there, um, found uh, an entry for John at the European General Hospital uh, um, in terms of his death. And then again, on the census of the European inhabitants, of the Bombay presidency. And that is where it indicates that he was born in India. Um, so we now know quite a bit about the parents. Um, oh, look at that. And Karen is saying, British and India is one of my special topics, have loads in our family. So that's great, Karen, thank you. Um, so then I doubly appreciate your efforts on this particular project. Okay, Anna um, goes to the, the French connection. There's a St. Michael's Anglican church um, 
where she indicated in her in her 1921 census form that there should be one. So great, we've confirmed that there's a British parish there. Um, and then also comments on the importance of fan research, which of course you all know I'm a big fan of. Um, so she found a connection through the British com commissioner who has connections with India and whose father was a doctor in Paris. So she shared that with us. So that's a great discovery as well. Okay, and then lastly, uh, oh, nope, two more. Um, Janice and Anna started asking questions, and I think this is a really, really great thing to do. Um, Janice is curious why she was unable to fill out the census form as usual. She could obviously read and write, right? We know that she wrote a novel. Surely she could have put a question mark or a side note where she was uncertain of details. And you know, she, you notice on the census, she didn't even write her name in the right column, right? She didn't attempt at any step to actually fill out the census appropriately. Um, and, and Janice says maybe she was a budding author or writer, right? Um, because she wanted her census form to be different. And then Anna starts to question kind of a, a different way of thinking, right? Various research uh, efforts over the years, I found lots and lots of people not quite telling the truth for lots of different reasons. And she kind of feels like she's, we're, we're getting a line here, right? She's spinning a line for some reason. And I think that's a really intriguing question, right? And it became one of the top things in my brain too. What's the motivation for writing your census return like this instead of just filling out what you know and leaving blank what you don't know? I also wonder about the enumerator, right? Why didn't he, why did he sign off on this? Why didn't he or she, um, you know, kind of sit there and, and fill out the rest of the form? You can see on the census return that they did make an effort to fill out some of the details, um, but not all, right? I, and again, even the name column is left blank. All right. Oh, let me, actually, before I do that, let's put this question up. Because Michelle just asked this, and I think it's a great thought. Is she a suffragette? Well, Michelle, we, don't, we wouldn't think so. We, uh, just instinctively, because by this point in England, um, the most women, some women, have the right to vote, right? That was authorized in 1918. But it does start to pick up some different ideas, right? We know in the 1911 census, there was a lot of political activity around the suffrage movement, lots of women hiding from the census takers, high, you know, not filling out their form because they weren't allowed to vote. Um, so it definitely starts the wheels turning, right? So Michelle, I think that's a, a good question to ask. Right. So when we look at the rabbit hole, what do we, where do we even start with this, right? So what's our strategy here? Um, we want to create a tree and a timeline for her. Um, we want to identify um, all of her vital events. We want to look at all of the other censuses that she might be in. We're going to try and identify her parentage, her grandparents, um, especially her paternal grandparents, right? Because we have more information on them than, uh, than her maternal. And we're going to start filling in the story after that point, right? Military records, civil service, fan research. Where else can we reach into? I had three real primary questions that I was asking myself on this particular rabbit hole. I was asking myself, how much of this is actually true? What can I prove? How much of this can I actually find evidence and documentation for? The second question I wanted to answer was, who was her father and her grandfather? I really was curious about how they end up getting into India, right? Um, especially if the father was born in India, they've been there for a while, he's married in India, he has a daughter in India, the generation before him is in India. I want to, I'm just kind of interested in how, why people leave England in the first place. So I wanted to be able to track them back to England if I could. Um, and the third thing I wanted to know was what happens to her, right? Where does she end up? What, what happens after all of this, um, after the 1921 census? Okay, so William's got a good comment. Let's put this up before we go any further. It sound, This sounds similar to a relative in my family who after a big fallout with relatives decided to change what info was passed forward to future generations. Could it simply be she was trying to hide or start a new life away from some negative event? Uh, yeah, absolutely, right? And I think at this juncture, kind of the sky's the limit on the theories that we could produce uh, around this particular individual. Okay, so let me see. So we started with a tree. This is what we think we know, right? Emily, the daughter of John and Eugenie. 
Um, we have, at least from the initial research, we've got birth and death dates for, for John. Um, we've got a death date for, for the mother, Eugenie, and we've got a birth year for Emily. <laughs> um, so this is the very start of our tree. And I will admit right now, if you looked at my Find My Past account, this is still what her tree looks like. I'm, I'm not going to be totally suspenseful. I did not find any evidence of a marriage or children from Emily. I did not find any other siblings um, for Emily. No other children of John and Eugenie. Um, it, this is as far as the tree goes throughout this process. So let's examine what we already have, right? Some of you found this and I went back and pulled the images and, and found them again for myself. Mary Eugene Hollingsworth is listed in the parish register transcripts from the presidency of Bombay, 1709 to 1948. It indicates that she was born the 21st of February, 1861 in Bombay, which is actually quite different than the year she put on the census, right? It's three years different than what she wrote down. She was baptized the 25th of March, 1861. Her father is John Thomas Hollingsworth. Her mother is Eugenia. It's important to note a couple of elements on this record, and some of you called it out on Facebook. Um, and one of those comments is that her father is listed as a private gentleman, formerly head clerk collector's office. And that is an indication for us for further research, right? That is an opportunity for us to research him as a civil servant and as a private citizen um, and, you know, outside of that occupation, right? So we know we are looking for records of John, both as a civil servant and outside of that scope. He is formerly head clerk. So when did that end? Who took over? What was his, what were his his duties and responsibilities in that role? And uh, records of the office should tell us that, right? We should be able to find that in the sense that all of those changes in positions would have been documented. So we can start to build out John's timeline of his life thanks to that role in civil service, but we can also start to narrow down that window of when that job ended and he moved into something else, right, from a career perspective. The other part of this record that is really important is um, the notation at the top, right? So this actually indicates that these are statements by Protestant ministers unconnected with the government by clergymen of the Roman Catholic persuasion or by laymen within the diocese of the Archdeacon of Bombay. She's Catholic, guys. She's being baptized in the Catholic Church. And so you immediately think British in India and you immediately kind of think Church of England. But in this instance, she she has a French mother, right? So the influence here is pretty easy to guess, pretty easy to theorize that her mother is saying she's going to be baptized as a Catholic. So this obviously should be a big clue that we are not just looking at Church of England records, we're actually looking in Catholic records as well as nonconformist records. We need to be looking across all religious records. So while many of you found this record, and I honed in on uh, the details of the baptism, it took me a few minutes to go, wait a second, it says something at the top of this page, right? We have to look at the entire document in its entirety and really understand what's happening on this page. This is a Roman Catholic baptism. I'm going to take a sip of water. Ellie's looking at me with quite suspense. Um, I am. I hopefully have you on the edge of your seat. Okay, the Society of Genealogists has an index card collection of the British in India. So we went there straight away. We found John T. Hollingsworth, head clerk, collector's office, 1851 slash 571. That's all it says. It's just a card index. Um, there's no other documentation there from, from the Society of Genealogists, but it does confirm from yet another source that he was kind of that head clerk collector's office. So great, we're, we're laying down the, the baseline of research around John. That's excellent. Then I started thinking about other opportunities. Now, there's a lot of research happening in the background that I've summarized in just a few slides. So bear with me. These are um, not necessarily in the order I actually did the research. But if we look at the full story that she provided on her census and we're looking at her parents, one of the things she talked about was this minister's wife. And I kept thinking, how can she possibly remember the name of the minister's wife 
but not remember basic information about her own self, right? Like that didn't quite line up for me. So um, I went to newspapers and I found that actually the minister himself was a relatively well-known minister who served in France for a number of years. He was involved in a number of different things. This example, the Illustrated London News from 1862, is actually talking about him participating in the opening of a new church in Paris. So he's actually all over the newspapers um, and is definitely the right guy. Uh, and it's definitely the same minister. So so from uh, that standpoint, you can kind of understand that, like, actually, yeah, she probably would have known um, about him just from press, right? Because he was in the paper so much. There's another entry in the newspaper um, from Allen's Indian Mail and Official Gazette. It's dated 1861 as well, and it's listing a number of passengers. There is a Mr. Hollingsworth listed in that snippet from that newspaper. Now, there's no first name, so I can't confirm that it's actually her father, but it lines up right that he would be possibly a passenger on a vessel going from, get this, from Marseille to Calcutta. So Mr. Hollingsworth is traveling from France back to Calcutta. Okay, we have another connection to Paris here, to, to France here. Um, so those two newspaper snippets lead me to believe and theorize that she actually probably was telling a whole lot of truth in her census return, right? She remembers some details and not all, but she's she's her story so far is checking out. All right, and then... Um, we get this little snippet, the Church of England on the Continent from 1863, page 269. I've actually found this on Google Books, and it does talk about this particular minister um, and his powerful sermons. In fact, the um, he's listed in here uh, where the Bishop of London actually attends one of his services and then compliments him afterwards saying, this is the right doctrine to preach um, and thanked him for his good service. So there's there's all sorts of kind of contextual information that puts this particular minister for the Church of England in the right place, in the right time. And, she, and if she was there, and theoretically she was because her papers end up with his wife, at some point, maybe he just made a really impactful kind of indent in her memory, right? So he's one of those people and his wife is someone to her that, she just carries with her for the rest of her life. Okay, we all have those people um, and certainly our ancestors had them too. Okay, so we go back to kind of the parents and step away from that contextual piece for a second. Um, and we learn from the GRO consular death in Dices, and of course this is one that you guys picked up on, that Marie Hollingsworth um, dies in Cairo, right? And I didn't order her death certificate, but I still might, um, but I knew it wouldn't come in time for this session. So um, I just let that go for now, uh, but I'll probably, I'll probably order it. Okay. And then we start getting into some of the really interesting stuff. And I'm going to do this again, slightly out of order. I go back to England. She does say in her 1921 census return that she travels to England. Um, let me just double check the dates here around 1886, 87. And I'm thinking, all right, so, um, right. How, where does she show up? in English records, right? She should be in England at some point. So we go to the 1911 census, just immediately after 1921. It's the first one available. It took me a little while to find her. She is enumerated as Emilette Hollingworth, no S. She lists herself as a widow, but she is born in Bombay, India in 1858. She is a servant in the home of Annie Renand, Renand excuse me, and his wife, Claudia Gentet, both residents of France. So once again, we have this French connection. We have a birth location and time frame that is approximately correct. Um, although it doesn't agree with her baptism, it does agree with what she believes to be true in the 1921 census. The one thing that strikes out to me, of course, is that she's listing herself as a widow. So I immediately went onto the rabbit hole, the tangent, looking for a marriage record of some kind, and I did not find one. Just did not find one. There's no evidence whatsoever that she ever got married. Um, so that takes me back. All right. We've got the, the 1911 census. Um, also, obviously, she's she's employed by people who are natives of France. So that's another really strong indicator, right? That's a trend that we're seeing throughout the research. 
Then we go back to the 1901 census, and I'm actually gonna um, I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see this a little bit better because you know 1901 is not as easy to read. So she's enumerated here as E. Hollingsworth. She again is listed as a servant, again as a widow, born 1858 in India. This time she's in the household of two uh, individuals or, or actually a family from Japan. Both the husband and wife are art dealers from Japan. So the household of R. Yamanaka, an art dealer, she is in Hinden um, in the London area, right? Um, and again, she's a servant. She's a domestic servant. It's... Um, Honestly, I have scoured both of these censuses. I firmly believe at this point that these are the right two women in the census, both 1901 and 1911. Um, I've looked at every other possibility I could find um, on Find My Past and other websites. I double checked on a number of different service providers just to make sure. And, and this for me is the match. This is the right, the right person. Uh, Linda mentions that she's looking for respectability. I think you're probably right, Linda. Um, she's listing herself as a widow because it's um, better than saying that you're a spinster at this point. Um, and it's probably easier to get employment, right, um, because of this. But these two censuses are really telling us something um, much bigger than that, right? What are we really seeing here? We've got a 1901 census where she's living in the household of Japanese uh, individuals. We've got the 1911 in which she's living with a French couple. She's likely more comfortable in households that have kind of this international flavor, right? Think about this. She was born in India. At some point, she, it appears she lives in Egypt. Um, she, her papers were lost to a, a, wife's, a minister's wife in France. So at some point, she was probably in France, in Paris. Um, she seems to be much more comfortable in this kind of international household, international community. So any additional research um, in terms of her domestic service employment after she gets back to England, if there is some indication that there is, you know, one woman, two people who match, we should be looking towards, leaning towards the one that matches from an international perspective. Right. This is a trend that we can identify and see in the way that she is accepting employment or, or taking on employment. Um, she's also, of course, claiming to be a widow. That's something that we should pay attention to. We also know from these census records that both her first and last names are really easily misinterpreted. Right. And again, I would think about her life experience. She's born in India. She spends time in Egypt. She goes, she then goes to France and now suddenly she's in England. She, her name is probably misinterpreted by just about everybody that meets her right? Um, because she doesn't have a traditional British name and she probably has an accent of some kind. So talking to other individuals, she is likely uh, to be misinterpreted and thus the records will be spelled in a number of different ways. Um, okay, so as we move through the census collection, of course, we want to think about all of those things as we work through her story. Just a few more um, findings to share with you. I tried to find evidence of her death. I was unable to do so. Um, but she is in the 1939 register. And she's enumerated again in a different way. Emily Hollinsworth. Uh, so again, a completely different uh, you know, interpretation of her surname and her first name. Born 14th of April, 1858. She is single. She is retired as a housemaid domestic service. All the details seem to check out, right? In this, um, in this record, in the 1939 register, um, she is at 77 Swafield Road in Wandsworth. And that, of course, is not a household. Uh, if you look at the snippet, it doesn't show a whole lot because she's right at the top. She's the second line there. Um, but it does give you indication that the, it says ditto, right, for the address. The, the address continues on the previous page and the page after that and the page after that and the page after that. Uh, this address is, of course, a workhouse. So in 1939, she's quite elderly at this point, um, and she is located in the Wandsworth Workhouse 
just immediately adjacent to the Wandsworth Cemetery. So I kind of am assuming she's probably buried there. Um, it's also near a prison and several other kind of institutions. Um, and her story then can, it just pretty much stops there, right? I don't think I had any more. Oh, I, I do have a couple more slides. Sorry. So a couple of the things that I haven't yet totally agreed that these are the right people. But little snippets that came up in the research that we can continue to work on. So the Bombay Gazette in May of 1829 lists in their departure listings a Lieutenant Hollingsworth, HM 20th, right? Her, His Majesty's at that point, 20th Regiment um, on board a vessel. So that could be her grandfather, right? Because he was in the British Army, according to her. And this is the right time frame, right? For him, for that to be him. We also have that mention from, I talked about, but I didn't show you, the Allen's Indian Mail and Official Gazette from 1861 that mentions a Mr. Hollingsworth. That could be her father. Um, and I think that's the end of the slides. It is. Okay, so that's where we got. We know a whole lot more about, um, about her than we ever did. I want to point out, though, one of the things that really took me some time, and this is what kept me up last night, was finding her in the 1939 register. Um, because I didn't find evidence of a death, I was just really just there was a, something in my brain, I guess an instinct, if you will, that said, I have to, I have to really understand if she's still alive for the 1939 register. Um, so what I did was I really manipulated the search in a number of different ways. Um, and I didn't prep a slide for this, but I, I probably should have. Um, what I ended up doing was searching for her last name with a number of wild cards. So I did H-O-L asterisk, G asterisk, W-O-R-T-H. I did her first name as an E with an asterisk. And then I took her birth year from 1857 and I expanded the plus or minus five years instead of the automatic two because we have her entry that says 1857-58, but we have a baptism that indicates 1860-1861. So there's a, a, a big question mark around her actual birth year, right? Um, and, and so expanding my search, giving me a lot of op options on this wildcard functionality on the first and last name finally opened up enough that I was able to find her in the 1939 register. I actually thought I had found her already, but it wasn't quite lining up, right? She was um, living with two other retired domestic servants, living on her own means. And I went, that just doesn't feel right for her. Um, so I kept digging and finally found the entry for the workhouse in 1939. And absolutely, there's no doubt in my mind that is her. So she ends her life in the workhouse, most likely. Um, it's, you know, at that point, she's in her 70s. It would be unlikely that she would have um, left the workhouse at any point. She's probably, she probably dies there. Um, but I couldn't, couldn't, didn't quite have enough time to dig through those records. All right. So that is her story. What a fascinating journey, right? We started with the 1921 census, Amelia. And what we learned is actually that we got to you know, a pretty comprehensive look at her life. There's still a lot of research that could be done on this family. We still don't know much about her grandfather. I'd still like to do that. Um, we still don't know technically like, you know, the service of her father. Don't know about aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's still plenty to be done. But if you think about what we started with, right, we'll just plop this back up on the screen. We took this one census document, we analyzed it and really torn it apart and really looked at how many other ways can we document this? How can we prove this or disprove her claims? And I think we've established a pretty good baseline for that. Okay. With that, I'm going to go back through some of the comments. I know Ellie is on her way out because she gets to host our Friday meeting, afternoon meeting. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, we will see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, all right. A couple of, let me just go back through the comments because I saw some of you talking, but I don't know what you said because I wasn't reading as I was going. Karen saying, pointing out the only census she would have completed was the 1921. Absolutely right. All of the other censuses were filled out for her, right? And that's why I think the misinterpretation of her name is so common across the records, right? Because she wasn't the one writing it. Um, and she was probably kind of 
uh, trying to make herself appear, appear a little bit more attractive, right? She, she works for these international households, but at the same time, she wants to be a good employee and, and reliable and, and safe, right? Um, for lack of a better word. So yeah, perhaps she's letting that misinterpretation go even. She's letting them make those assumptions. Um, okay, so Anna saying all the details check out, but it seems she doesn't have the documentation, but she knows where to find them. Could it be that someone didn't want her to have them for some reason? Maybe we're hiding something here, but they were kept in the trust so that she knew where it could be verified if needed. Absolutely possible. Yeah. Um, my brain has been going in circles for the last week trying to understand why her papers were left with the minister in France in the first place. Also, um, I mean, and understandable maybe that she never collected them, but she clearly knew her own history. And so again, we go back to that question of why didn't she just fill out the census the right way in the first place? So what is the motivation for actually writing this novel on the census instead of just filling out the form, right? She clearly knew the information because everything she said lines up, but she took this kind of, you know, uh, narrative approach to the census and didn't follow the instructions when she she easily could have right um so still a lot of questions in my brain around motivation um uh, definitely something um definitely something to still think about um and and yeah i will admit that i'm probably not going to be able to let this go i will probably keep working on this story we'll see we'll see how much time i have in my immediate future um okay all right, Mary says, I'm really enjoying this genealogy journey. Thank you, thank you, Mary, that's nice of you. Give me the kick I need to get back at my brick walls. You know what, that's great. I will admit, um, well, first of all, I will say that's exactly what this community is for and so good at is, is keeping us all inspired. I will admit last night when I was looking through the 1939 register, I was ready to give up. And in the background, I had a webinar playing on um, uh, from Paul Milner, a, a British expert in genealogical research here in the States and, and a man that I really respect, right? He's incredibly intelligent and knowledgeable. And in the webinar, he's, he made it, I was kind of only half paying attention, but he makes a comment. He says, don't give up on name searches. They have to, they should be in there, right? Go to all the different websites, look at all the different records, play with the wild cards, use the search functionality that's built into sites like Find My Past to really find the material you're looking for. They should be there. And he was talking about British censuses. And I went, you know what? I'm going to give the 1939 register one more go. And I really uh, changed my strategy and my research and how I was searching for her because of Paul's comments in that webinar that he recorded, you know, however many months ago. Um, so absolutely great um, that we, we get inspiration from each other kind of all over the place, right? I think Anna's right about this too. Another great comment. If she did marry, the chances are that she would have taken her husband's name, right? So maybe she claimed she was a window, a widow because she had an illegitimate child, or again, she was trying to um, uh, be more respectable, right? You're, you're right, Anna. She would have been enumerated under a different name. And thus we wouldn't have seen her in the 1901 or the 1911 census where she says she's a widow. So yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Right. So let's see. Some of you, oh, oh, Karen might have found something that I missed. A Mary Hollingsworth, death register 1953, age 95 in Islington. Wow. Okay, I definitely didn't look that far out for sure. I would have illumined, I would not have thought that she um, got to that age, but I am going to take a look at that. That's an interesting little comment. Thank you, Karen, for that. We'll see if we can um, uh, take that any further. Um, right. <laughs> Sally's saying, don't you dare let it go. Okay. Okay, Sally. <laughs> I know how to follow instructions. Um, <laughs> um, so I will, I will, I will keep going. I will keep going. Um, Karen, a different Karen, Emily Hollingsworth died in January, 1954 in Wandsworth. So there's a couple of different opportunities there. Maybe I'm just, you know, not giving her enough credit. Maybe I'm I'm underestimating her ability to live a very long life. And a couple other people have found that too. Okay. All right. So it looks like we've gone through most of the comments, I think. Um, and another fabulous session on Friday. I hope 
that um, you guys are all really enjoying your discoveries and stories, especially in the 1921 census. It's just been so fun to, to peel through. Um, I absolutely am loving it. So I will remind you guys that if you find a fabulous story that you want to share with us, send it in, discoveries at findmypast.com. We would love to hear from you, um, possibly even feature you on our blog or in one of these video sessions. Who knows? The opportunities are endless. Um, but if you would like to share your discoveries with us, we would love to hear from you. So please do send those emails in. In fact, Ellie is the one who gets those emails. Um, so share your stories and your discoveries. We would love to hear what you guys have been up to. Um, and I think we will leave it at that. A couple of people chiming in saying how interesting that was. I'm glad. Um, thank you very much. That's really, really kind of you. Um, and thinking about, oh, you know what? This is a great comment to leave us with. Beth, thank you. Sometimes it's worth thinking outside the box when researching someone or a family group. Definitely. Definitely want to think outside the box. It's one of my favorite things to do. All right. With that, uh, we will say goodbye. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, enjoy your research. Uh, and we will see you next week. We have, uh, again, a number of sessions coming up that are going to be quite interesting um, uh, over the course of the next several weeks. So please do have a good time doing your research. Enjoy yourselves. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And we will see you next week. <laughs>